Okay, so we stopped in the middle of looking at Russian art of the early 20th century before the Reading Week break. You know, that's art of a country going through quite a political transformation. You know, in many ways, a relatively backward country in the late 19th century, you know, throwing off feudalism, really. Um, authoritarian rule, the Tsars. Um, and then in 1917, in the midst of the First World War, a revolution. And what we've already been seeing is something of a revolution in Art II uh, happening before the actual revolution itself. Of course, the political revolution too had its, um, you know, Pre, you know, precursors it didn't sort of happen overnight in 1917. Uh, but yeah, there's a sort of question comes up of how the two two things come together. Yeah, and, and do they come together at all? Artistic revolution or radical artistic change and radical political change. Um, According to Marxist theory, you know, the, the, real, the real force of change in society happens at the economic level and then things like art and you know, the, ch the changes gradually work their way through to that. Um, but we were seeing change in art before we were seeing such a, a radical change in politics. You know, artworks like The Black Square by Malievich are consciously iconoclastic new beginnings going back down to the basics and then building up from that so a question would be you know is this an art appropriate for the new society you know it, it seems to be an art telling a story of a, 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 a new beginning uh, but is it actually an art it wasn't an art created it had its roots in the old society. It, did, it wasn't created as a response to the new, new revolutionary society. Actually, what happens is that the modernist artists uh, become amongst the most enthusiastic supporters of the new society. And there's a whole new art school system set up that they can work in that art school system with its model of basic education, foundational study, uh, influenced later the German Bauhaus art, school, art and Design School, and from there influenced um, the, the patterns of art education that still exist today. You know, usually in uh, art school systems, you s still have a model of doing a foundation year before you go on to do your degree. degree study. Uh, the Minister of Culture, I'm sort of lightly calling him that, Lunacharsky, the People's Commissariat of Enlightenment, was headed by Lunacharsky. He took a kind of open-ended, kind of open sort of view of supporting all kinds of art, not just the modernist art, he tried for a kind of pluralistic approach at first. But as I say, the modernists were amongst the most um, supportive. So we ended here with this work by Tatlin. As a sculptor, he was one of the people who was you know, breaking the language of art back down to zero. In this case, sort of exploring the possibilities of bringing together a few basic materials and textures using a, a sort of montage effect borrowed from cubist collage originally and then trying to, 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 to make abstract sculpture from that. Abstraction is a big theme in Russia as we saw. It's not the only theme but, but it's a big theme. And this is dated to 1915 so just two years before the revolution so let's move on to something new.
project by Tatlin for the monument to the Third International, 1920. It's a monument. I mean, often monuments are, thing, are about things in the past, but this is sort of about something that's just happening. It's a sort of monument for the present, so that's a different kind of task. The international is, uh, you know, the third international was set up by the Russian leader Lenin in 1919. It's the, the idea is to promote the revolution internationally. Um, all that ever existed was a model and some drawings for this proposed monument. Um, and what we're looking at here is more just a modern reconstruction of that model. Uh, the thing itself was never built because there just were, wasn't the resources to build it. It was like a, a utopian project that could never take place at that point in time. Uh, it was intended as a, a massively um, tall structure. You know, just the, 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 the resources that would have been needed to, to produce something like that were not um, you know, just not available at that time. You know, that, that this is just after the revolution. It's just after the end of the First World War in 1918. Everything, priorities are, are, are pretty basic at that point in time in the new society. Uh, for example, the, the, the Russian leader Trotsky, he says, well, we're just repairing the pavements and the sewage pipes. You know, we don't, we don't have the resources to to build something like this. Um, it has its precedents uh, as a tower. I suppose perhaps the most obvious precedent would be the Eiffel Tower in Paris, which actually was itself, we tend to forget this perhaps now, but it, it was a self-built um, to, to memorialize a revolution. It was built on the hundredth, for the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. So here's another tower about a revolution, memorializing a, a, a revolution. Um, it has um, you know, something of the metal girder structure of the um, Eiffel Tower, but doesn't have the really the kind of the base that uh, the Eiffel Tower has. It's a, it's a, a different thing that's in, envisaged here. So Tatlin's Tower was supposed to be taller than the Eiffel Tower. It was supposed to be the tallest such, such structure in the world. Um, Another tower is it, uh, it could be a, a, a source of precedent for it. It is the Tower of Babel. That's not an actual tower. It's a, a tower as described in the Bible, um, the, the, the Old Testament of the Bible, and which you may know from a Bruegel painting. In the Bruegel painting, uh, the tower has this sort of spiral um, you know, path up the outside of it. So it, it's uh, inspired by the textual description, but perhaps also more immediately by, by Borigo's um, conception of that tower. And the story of the, the, the Tower of Babel is a story about how God sees this as uh, mankind's uh, hubris, mankind's pride, and stops the building process by uh, you know, causing linguistic confusion, you know, that they, they can no longer uh, talk to each other, they all have their own separate languages. It's a kind of story of the beginning of, la of separate languages. So the Tower of Babel is, is like a, 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 a precedent for this one, but it's also the opposite because this is about unity. You know, the story of the revolution is a story of unity, international unity as well, not just unity of the working people. Um, yeah, I suppose he's also thinking of the tall structures in the Kremlin in Moscow, the Great Kremlin uh, 
belfry, the bell tower, the sort of freestanding uh, bell tower. There's also a mosque in Samara in Iraq called the El Maquia, El Maquia Mosque, uh, which takes this spiral f form too. I think it's intended, uh, uh, Tatlin's monument, as a sort of modern wonder of the world and therefore to be compared to uh, ancient wonders of the world, the lighthouse of Alexandria and, and so forth, this sort of thing. The sighting is intended to be in St. Petersburg, you know, one of the two greatest cities of, of Russia. And it's designed to straddle, straddle the river, the river Neva. St. Petersburg is a, a, a waterfront city. So, yeah, it acts like a kind of bridge across the river in a way. And actually, that was where the, um, the revolution started, in a way. It came across the bridge from an island over the Palace Bridge. So it sort of ties in with the history of the October Revolution, the 1917 Revolution. Tatlin's father was an engineer, so that's partly why he's thinking in, in these terms. So it's, it's a sort of architectural structure, but it's also some kind of uh, uh, sculptural idea as well. The spiral form, I suppose it's a very simple kind of symbol of progress, but um, you know, in Marxist theory, progress happens dialectically. You know, capitalism gives rise to a proletariat, which eventually leads to the toppling of Capitalism. So progress is sort of in a kind of dialectical form, not a straight line. And maybe the, the spiral perhaps can indicate that kind of idea a little bit better. Progress, but not in a, in a straight line. Anyway, something of a, a positive symbol. And um, a national symbol, but a symbol of... of, of socialism uh, as an international idea. Well, iron, but also glass. There are three structures inside intended to be. Although from the, between the drawings and the model, some of the details does shift, you know, the idea is sort of in progress. So it, this could be, um, a more sort of cubic form than a pyramid form, and then it seems a sort of cylinder form. And these were intended as big meeting rooms. Um, so each had their own separate uh, civic uh, purpose. This was a more kind of a administrative uh, side. And up on, up on top was more about propaganda functions like uh, uh, the press and so forth. Uh, and each of the three structures was meant to turn and turn at a different rate. So the bottom one was meant to turn once a year, this would be once a month, and this would be once a day. So, you know, there's a tinge of uh, futurism in, in all this, you know, the love of dynamism. And the, the, t the turning, the twisting would kind of amplify the visual form of the spiral, I suppose, the idea. Of, I think, and, and at night, everything could be lit up, and the glass walls would be double, so it would be like a thermos flask that uh, you know, k keeps the heat in and so forth. So, so meant to be technologically at the growing edge of things. Uh, another source, maybe I didn't mention, is the uh, Coney Island Fairground architecture in New York. You know, that at the time was already uh, in existence. Yeah, so all of these things lead into it. Um, different people had different 
uh, opinions. You know, some people thought, oh, I, actually, it's no good because it's, it looks like it's about to collapse. It's got a sort of instability about it. So the very thing that's giving it a dynamism um, actually, for some people, made it not look quite, quite right. I, I just want to find in my notes some statements about it. I mean, not so much just to tell you about this particular monument and how people responded to it, but to give you this sense that there are debates going on about what the role of art should be in the new society. Should it be like this or should it, should it not? Uh, uh, like, for example, there had been this um, a contest for uh, a monument which Lenin himself, the, the Soviet leader, had initiated in 1918, just after the revolution competition for mod monument. And it tended to come up with individual portrait statues in a, in a traditional style of, you know, Marx and Engels and so forth. Um, but then the, the debate starts to be, is that enough? Is it enough just to have revolutionary subjects? Maybe we need to change the whole form of, um, of the monument. So those kind of ideas come up in, in, in the thinking, the debate uh, about appropriateness of of a, of a different style. And that debate, debate really is an interesting one theoretically and it goes on for some time and it only ends really when Stalin um, puts an end to it by just sort of saying, imposing in 1934 that the, the state style is going to be a realist style or fake realist style, whatever you want to call it. So. Um, yeah, for, I'll just maybe pick out a little bit uh, from uh, one article about it published in 1920, so it's just a, a year after the monument was proposed by N. N. Punin, because this is a, something he wrote about it. So he says, talking about um, you know, the, the insufficiency of um, traditional monuments. He says, it, it is true that communist governments for a certain time will use as a means of monumental propaganda figurative monuments in the style of Greek and Italian classicism. But this is only because these governments are forced to use them in the same way as they are compelled to use specialists of the pre-revolutionary school. Figurative monuments, Greek and Italian, are at variance with the contemporary reality in two respects. They cultivate individual heroism and conflict with history. Torsos and heads of heroes and gods do not correspond to the modern interpretation of history. Their forms are too private for places where there are, you know, well, he's using an old Russian measure of distance. Let me translate as, there are 10 kilometers of proletarians in rows. At best, they express the character, feelings, and thoughts of the hero. But who expresses the tension of the emotions and the thoughts of the collective thousand? A type, you know, some figure that represents the worker or something like that. But a type concretizes, limits and levels the mass. The mass is richer, more alive, more complicated and more organic. Even if a type is portrayed, figurative monuments contradict actuality even more through the limitation of their expressive means, their static quality. The agitational action of such monuments is extraordinarily weak amidst the, the, the noise, movement, and dimensions of the streets. So this is the kind of argument that would be made for modernism as being more appropriate as the art of a new society. Um, you know, Lenin himself is a bit skeptical. He's sort of saying, uh, well, his emphasis is on, well, let's just deal with basic literacy and things like that. Let's, um, you know, be educate the working people, improve the quality of their, li their lives, and then later all this sort of thing uh, will, will come, uh, you know. <coughs> Here's, uh, just read a little bit more from Punin. It's a very long article, but I'll just pick out a little bit where he's talking about the the forms where he's trying to read the symbolism of it. So he says, the whole form oscillates like a steel snake, constrained and organized by the one general movement of all the parts. 
to raise itself above the earth. The form wants to overcome the material and the force of gravity. The strength of the resistance is enormous and massive. Straining every muscle, the form finds an outlet through the most elastic and rapid lines which the world knows, through spirals. They are full of movement, aspiration and speed. They are taut like the creative will and like a muscle tense with a hammer. It's, al it's almost like the language of the, the futurists, and of course these Russian artists were very aware of futurism. Uh, they're borrowing something that was designed for a uh, Italian nationalistic uh, art, uh, taking it uh, for their own purposes. Rodchenko, another of the important pioneers of Russian art at this time, works in many different medias, in photography, in sculpture, uh, and in painting, he also produces applied art objects, design objects. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that as well. Black on Black, 1918. So this is just one year after the revolution, and it's it's a, a very reductive work, breaking with uh, with realism. Again, it's got a sort of dynamism about it, like the Tatlin work. Very, often you're very much aware of the, the sort of texture and materials in his work. He, it's as if he, a bit like Tatlin, I suppose, they have something in common that they, they seem to emphasize the actual materials. And they're both very materialist in their um, worldview, unlike Malievich or Kandinsky, who have much more sort of spiritual worldview. So similar vocabulary to Malievich in a way, but very different motivation. construction of distance, 1920. Well, it's a really very simple kind of sculptural form just made of arrangement of a few geometric blocks. Breaking down the old ways of doing it and building up from, from, from a new basis seems to be the rhetoric of, of it all. In the art schools, they will have a lot of kind of exercises with different materials, you know. Uh, on the one hand, it seems kind of formalistic, you know, you're very concerned with form and materials for its own sake, but it maybe it was presented more as, here we are, uh, we're just doing this as an exercise, we're experimenting with, uh, you know, what we can do with this particular material or this kind of form. So it had a kind of, a practical or pedagogical justification, um, even if it wasn't uh, useful. And, and there must have been sort of pressures towards usefulness in the new society with the resources so scarce. Um, this is a sculpture produced by the American artist Carl Andre called Style Element series 1975 you really have to wait that long before you see artists sort of taking up this kind of reductive experiment this is Carl Andre was one of the founders really of the American minimalist art uh, there's a, a, a big gap partly because a lot of this Russian art was not so well known in the West there's a kind of uh, aura about it that, ooh, it's the art of a communist society, especially in America, that creates a certain kind of hang-up about, ooh, you know, it's nothing to do do, do what we're doing. Um, but also because of the separation, especially later with the Cold War, but even before then you have a sort of cultural separation and a lot of this art, where it survived at all, it sort of went into museums and was not really displayed in, uh, later on in the, the new society, certainly in the Stalinist era. So it's rather later that researchers can get to, to, to know about it and write about it. And there aren't many examples of it that ever found their way into Western collections. Uh, so you, if you don't get to see the art, what, how can you be inspired by it? You know, there are 
I think I've said this before, but there are, you know, there are great artists whose work doesn't happen to um, spread around the world very much. You know, almost all the good works by Turner are, are in Britain for some reason, because that's where the patrons bought it. Um, all, almost all the good works by Friedrich are in Germany, because you know, he was popular in his own country. So there's something of a problem like that with the influence of this Russian art. So it's only in a much later date you start to see the influence of a, a Rodchenko on a Karl Andre. Karl Andre, he, he worked for a while um, on the railways. His job was assembling trains, you know, assembling carriages to make up a train. You know, so, so it's all about joining units that are the same and you just join them together to make a larger unit and that kind of influences his art practice. But back to Rodchenko, um, yeah, another of his sculptures, Hanging Construction, also 1920. So in the very early years of the revolution, already doing quite radical experiments, as the name suggests, it's a sculpture to hang in the air, all oh, this is very new, almost every sculpture up to this point in time has just stood on the ground and had a base, here there is no such thing. There's empty space in it, you know, it's, uh, it's got a sort of cosmological uh, quality, almost like it's uh, a scientific model modeling the, um, you know, the orbits of planets or some, something like that, something you see in a science museum. So a whole new thinking in, in sculpture. You know, each individual sculpture proposes a whole series of directions which maybe the artists themselves don't have time to even explore themselves. Um, Garbo. Um, Garbo was one of the few Russian constructivists, and constructivist or constructivism is a term that's often used to describe them, it, whose work really was known in the West. Garbo and another artist called Pevsner, uh, they both um, went and, 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 and lived in the West, so that there is something of a, um, you know, some influence that they have. Sometimes they are thought to, to, to be Russian constructivism because they're the, they're the only part of the story that was known in the West. So like the Rodchenko that we've just been looking at, there's that sense of transparency of form, empty space is part of the sculpture. It also has this quality of being like a, a sign a mathematical model of a, you know, some three-dimensional conception. Um, using modern materials, plastic perspectives, whatever, um, with their transparency, linear forms of the wire. All is very new. Uh, a slightly earlier work by Garbo, 1916, the year before the revolution, Constructed Head Number 2. Uh, this is a sort of work you could trace back a little bit more easily to earlier modernist sources. You could trace it back to something like Picasso's um, uh, Head of a Woman from 1909. You know, just as in his cubist paintings, he was fragmenting form. So in cubist sculpture, he did something similar. Um, it is, unlike the Garbo, it is a solid form, but you get this feeling of as if these forms were, would continue into the head. Um, stylized certain forms of her hair and they rhyme with the forms of her eyebrows, her nose, or chin. He's digging into the sculptural form. It's a little bit similar to the fragmenting, breaking down of forms into faceted planes in the Cubist painting of the same time. And then with Garbo, it's, it, it's just one step further from that, where the, these sort of forms actually do become 
open, you, know, you can see space within the head. He's using welding of sheets, so that's all taken from Picasso and his collaging method as he developed it into three dimensions. This is a, one of the very late works he produced, in fact, the revolving tor torsion fountain from 1973 to 5. It's in London, I think you can tell from the, the setting of the Houses of Parliament in the back here. Uh, I, I think that water takes the place of the, line, the transparent lines. It's a way of keeping the transparency and keeping the linear quality but putting them together with another thing he was interested in investigating in sculpture, and that was uh, dynamism. He actually was one of the first people to produce kinetic sculpture, sculpture with moving parts to it. Um, so he puts the, the, that, those two areas of exploration together in a work like this, where you have the kind of quasi-linear quality of the water jets, uh, creating a kind of plane but you also have movement. There's movement, of course, of the water itself, but the whole sculptural body also turns, I guess, under water pressure too, is forcing that to happen. The same water pressure helps move it around when the sculpture's turned on. <coughs> and the, the, you know, the, the colors you see of the water is, is a sort of gray color similar to the body of the the sculpture, so it becomes an extension. Actually, fountain sculpture is, is a, a, a sort of kinetic sculpture with a long history, but uh, we don't often think of it that way. But this is an attempt to produce a sort of modernistic version of such a, uh, a kinetic sculpture. Popova. Her constructivist composition, 1921. I'm going to move a little bit faster here, introducing a number of different names. Um, yeah, she's an important uh, figure in a way. I, I, it's hard to imagine this sort of thing without cubism, you know, the, the, the sort of shading of, uh, that she's in, included in these sort of angles against the, the linear elements, it reminds us of the shading in, a, in an early cubist painting like Picasso or Bra. But you're very much aware of the materials, you know, the bare wood surface and its own intrinsic qualities come through and those uh, are more organic forms of the wood itself which um, plays against the geometry. So. Geometry is not so uh, dominant as you might think once you get down to it, the forms of the wood. And sometimes the wood is background, sometimes it seems to be a form, uh, part of the foreground, you know, so it all sort of tangles in together and it's all very dynamic. Again, that's the sort of futurist element, like futurist lines of force and everything. So it, this is the kind of thing you could do in the post-revolutionary period, you could justify it as a kind of laboratory experiment, you know. Yeah, scientists are allowed to experiment in their laboratory. What about us artists? We, we conduct experiments. So don't attack me that I've just made an abstract painting that is bourgeois and irrelevant to the needs of the new society. I'm just doing an experiment, you know, like a, a musician, they practice their scales or whatever, you know. It may not sound like a piece of music, but it's important for them to do that. Um, that's the kind of kind of thinking that was common then, and and, and uh, you know th there's always an aura of rationality. You know the c the concern with geometry. Uh, they're looking for some kind of rational basis for art. Often, sometimes it's um, applying this geometric abstract vocabulary in pr actual practical objects such as Stepanova's designs for sports clothing. This is 1923. We're only six years into a revolution, so it's really kind of 
imagining the visual culture or design s style, the style of the new revolution. You know, and these are artists proposing one possible way of, of, of doing that. Very bold, and, you know. It may be in design, well, like fashion design, it might be more acceptable to use um, uh, you know, abstract forms than it would be in art. More people would be willing to accept it. Uh, and sports clothing is not street clothing, it's some sort of special kind of costume, so you even have more freedom there than you would in everyday dress, you know. You're less likely to be, be criticized about it. So Stepanova is also, she's very important figure in this time. Rodchenko also went into thinking about fashion, his workers' costume, 1920. This is, he, this is him himself modeling it. You know, this is a, you know, the, an idea for work, workers' costume. And it, 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 there are two things. There is kind of the, the pressure to be utilitarian, to be useful. And then there's the look of being u u utilitarian. There's the the idea of having rational design, and then there's design that has the look of being rational. You know, that has lots of geometrical, sort of mathematically calculated, sort of aura about it. The two don't necessarily uh, are not necessarily the same thing. Even poor old Kandinsky has to, to go along this uh, route. You know, he was in, back in Russia in the early years of the revolution. And you, uh, we saw this before, I'm just reminding you, that you know, at one point he's applying his abstract language of painting to a practical object. Of course, he, he, he had done that a little bit during the years of the... Uh, it's sort of art, the, his what you could call his Art Nouveau phase when he was in in Munich. You know, he made some designs for practical objects there, like a woman's sew purse for sewing objects and things like that. So it's not so far. But you know, when you look, when I look at Rodchenko, I think here's someone who really believes in the new society and really believes in this project of trying to create new design for it. Uh, in the case of Kandinsky, I'm not so sure he really believes in it. I think he's sort of being pushed to do something that's not really where he wants to go. So you feel that slight ambivalence between, is this done in good faith or not? You know, is it done uh, because people really believe in this? Or is it a kind of a little bit of an excuse that I'm just doing laboratory experimentation? Uh, you know, so don't, uh, don't, you know, don't, don't get angry with me. I'm just doing research, or is it for real or not? You know, is it is it kind of a cover to go on being uh, a sort of bourgeois abstract artist in the new society? Of course, there were. I, I don't really have time to go into everything, but the, you know, the same ideas are applied in architecture as well. I'm looking at um, a little bit at design, but the same is true architecture. And this is a, a good parallel to make, uh, to try to look at the strengths and weaknesses of this modernist vocabulary, this abstracted vocabulary, for the purposes of the new society. This is um, using the same language of abstract art that was developed really by Malievich. Uh, Lazitsky, he's important in his own right as an artist, but I think you could say his vocabulary is very strongly influenced by Malievich, you know, the, the geometric forms that seem to be floating in space, this sort of overlap of one form with another, uh, a, a sense of kind of a cosmic space that one could imagine moving through and seeing things from different angles. Um, that's the vocabulary that Elisitsky has taken from uh, Malievich, but here he's using it in a work with propaganda purpose, rather than in a pure expressive work of art to, uh, uh, you know, express sort of spiritual truths, primal emotion. 
beat the right beat the whites with the red wedge 1919 so this is two years into the revolution where still there is kind of fighting going on with the conservatives uh, in the revolutionary project is not fully uh, established yet the conservatives are called the whites the white Russians you know that's why we have you know just down the hill there's a restaurant called Zarina which is a, a restaurant that sells uh, food that is sort of influenced by white Russian food food uh, the, the white Russians some of them escaped to Shanghai and eventually came to Hong Kong and that's why the Russian um, or Eastern European soup borscht is very <laughs> common in Hong Kong as a, a there's a, a sort of traditional set Western meal is to have borscht and then you have a steak, steak and chips, and that that borscht is the kind of the the white white Russian remnant in Hong Kong. How we tie into that cultural history. Um, it may not be much like the original Russian borscht, but anyway, I don't make a comparison between this one and. Uh, and propaganda work from the same time period, actually one year later, 1920, by an artist called Moore, who is using uh, more realist methods. You know, that actually there were the, it's very similar to a, a well-known post, poster, uh, British poster, you know, a, a recruitment poster. I want you for the, to sign up for the war, you know go get killed <laughs> um, um, the, the, you know the illusionism of the of the scream for shortening you know. have you volunteered it's your turn you know you you, <coughs> you know, to, uh, but is it more effective more people would understand the language already so that they can uh, you know, respond to it. This is an image that wants to get some work done. It wants to get people volunteered, you know. It wants to act, it's an activist image. I, is it more likely to be successful than, than this image? But in a way, an abstract vocabulary, it's, it, it, it also can put across an idea in a, in a, in a certain way. Red is communism, it's active, it's attacking the, the old thing. It's an image that could stay in your brain, you know, you can you know, help you conceptualize something. Uh, he's putting words in, of course words will help to, that's a strategy we see in Cubist painting of including words that helps to emphasize the two-dimensionality of the design and so forth, but it could also help convey meaning in, in, in an image. Well, so this is a, the kind of dialogue that's going on amongst artists and amongst um, writers about art. What is the most appropriate style? This is another one, just while we're looking at El Lizitsky. Um, a work that he, it was uh, is stored in the Cabinet of Abstract Art, 1926. So, so this is made for an exhibition outside of uh, Russia, outside of the Soviet bloc, in an inter international exhibition. So it's, it's modernism used to demonstrate the modernity of Russian society. Of course, that's another advantage that the modernist style has. It shows your culture as kind of being advanced and that that's indeed how they want you to think about it as being we're one step ahead of other people who are still in the capitalist mode of society. Uh, what we're looking at, it's actually the same thing uh, again, uh, viewed from a different angle, same abstract um, construction viewed from a different angle. But from this angle, you see lines. From that angle, the, the, the lines sort of blur together. So it's kind of a, a, an advanced idea of the context in which an object is displayed, uh, you know, influences the object itself or is in some sense part of the object. That's an idea that comes back big in the time of the minimalist like Carl Andre. He talks about his sculptures as being not self-contained, but they're just 
cut into the space that, in which they're installed. Um, so here, Elisitsky is also very aware of the environment and activating the environment. So in terms of ex exhibition display, it's a, it's a, it is a sort of cutting edge idea, you could say. Even the medium of photography, who, which you would think uh, naturally might ally itself to um, a more realist approach. Uh, a camera is a machine for making Renaissance uh, perspectival images, if you like. But in the hands of Rodchenko, he uses it as a tool for modernism. This is his cogwheels of 1930. So he's an artist who likes to use different medium. So he himself is, is, is quite important. Uh, you know, he writes about uh, the role of uh, photography. something that he, he wrote about it. Um, yeah. So he says, the revolution in photography in no way means that instead of a czarist general, a leader of the workers is photographed using the old techniques just as during the old regime or under the influence of the West. The revolution in photography means that the photograph fact, thanks to its quality, the how of the picture, should be of such a strong and unexpected effect that not only can it compete with paintings, but can be a new definite tool to help discover the world of today's mankind in science, technologies, and ways of living. The shot of a newly built factory is not a simple object, but a source of pride and joy in the industrialization of our country. And that is what we must show, the how of photography. To do this, we are duty bound to experiment. To photograph simple facts, just as describing them simply, that is nothing new, and in that is the harm. So, you know, rather than showing uh, a factory, you know, and saying, oh, look at this wonderful new factory in a sort of real, realist mode. He's gone up really close and showing the cogwheels of one of the machines, and that, that gives a more a rhetorical, uh, you know, uh, image of, of, the, of modernity, even though it could also be criticized as being very formalistic. You know, you can't see the whole machine. You don't know what kind of machine it is, what production line this is, what is being made here. We, we're losing out on certain information perhaps uh, or we might end up just saying oh well these just are very beautiful shapes or we might have a kind of futurist abstract interest in things in motion that would be the attack against this to say that or it could be just a very oblique angle to looking up at a radio tower there was this radio tower built in the early 1920s in, in Moscow, whereas Tatnin's monument wasn't, this radio tower was. So it becomes a kind of symbol of, of um, well, both the, the height of it, but also the function of it, radio at that time being, you know, kind of cutting edge technology. I suppose it would be something to do with internet or something that we would fetishize in the same way as, you know, to do with the growing edge of technology now. And the association is also, uh, radio is a medium to propagate information about the revolution and so forth. So it, it's, it's, it's all, uh, that's the kind of thinking here. Well, you see, he's, it's actually a trick he's used more than once, the kind of low angle looking up. Pioneer. Girl with Leica. Like 
1934. Well, Leica, of course, was the first of the um, film roll 35 millimeter cameras. You know, instead of putting a large plate into a, a, a large box of a camera, um, someone had the idea of using, similar to the, the rolls of film used for, for, for movies, and then you can sh shoot a whole roll and um, your camera becomes a more portable object. So these kind of viewpoints that you have, uh, like here, using a funny angle or whatever, it comes from this world of the handheld camera, such as the one that she has herself. But here's an example of someone doing something very similar, but with very different aims. This is by Moholy Naj. <coughs> Untitled view from Berlin Radio Tower in winter, 1928. So same time frame, even a similar object. He's, he's not looking up at a radio tower. He's looking down from a radio tower, uh, unlike Rodchenko. But it, it's a similar idea of using an unusual angle. But in his case, it's more for formalistic purposes. He's trying to make photography into kind of a, a modern abstract formalistic art. So artists with quite different results could come to, you know, quite different aims could come to similar results. And that's why, you know, an artist like Rodchenko could be criticized as, oh, you're just a formalist, you know, you're just interested in art for art's sake, you know, making interesting shapes or whatever, uh, uh, rather than, you know, looking at it in a proper way and all that. as well as photography in a fairly straight way, like those Rodchenko works. Clusis uh, is using photo in, uh, you know, with a montage technique. You know, it all goes back to Cubist collage, of course. So much does in 20th century art. Photo montage poster from 1930. Well, it's a, a simple collectivist idea of many small hands together make one big hand, the power of the collective, when we all act together, we can be strong, that kind of idea. But then, on the other side of it, are the artists who are using realism. So, Brodsky, Lenin at the Smolny. The Smolny was uh, Lenin's uh, headquarters for you know, his revolutionary headquarters, the Smolny Institute. This is a fairly late work by um, Isaac Brodsky. He lived to 1939, 1884 to 1939. So you can call it realism. Of course, it's idealized re realism, as so much realism is, in fact. Yeah, we should always, I've, I, I've said this more than once already, but um, you know, we should always make the distinction between realism as a style and truthfulness. You know, just because something is realistic doesn't make it truthful. Whether Lenin ever sat down in the small meat like this, you know, we don't know. <laughs> That's, uh... It's, it's use, using realism to, you know, to project ideology because realism has the aura of truth about it. The sheer detail makes us believe it's truthful, but the two things are different. To have lots of detail doesn't mean that something is true. I could tell a very detailed lie about, you know, how there was an elephant in this room before you arrived, but I managed to get it to leave, you know. And uh, the, the elephant was this high, and uh, I, you know, I could go on for a long time to tell you lots of detail about it, but that doesn't mean that there really was an elephant, you know. It's yeah. 
Uh, Brodsky was um, mentored by you know, the great figure of Russian realism. This is Repin, you know, one quite famous work by him from the 1880s, 1884 to 8. They did not expect him. So as, as, a, as a political prisoner has been released, unexpectedly he returns home. So here is realism with a sort of critical edge, if you like, in the old society. But then here is realism used to you know, support the status quo of the new society. There are a few artists in um, Soviet Russia who used a slightly more modernistic element within a more within what is basically a, a kind of realist mode. Yeah. And one good example is Pimenov. He's not one of those abstract artists that we've been looking at, but um, yeah, there is something modernist about the stylization, the elongation of the figures. It's in the service of creating an ideology, an ideological image about the great success of uh, modern industry in, in Russia, collective effort, and so forth. But the the mean, you know, it, it, it's a, you could see the realist equivalent to this. But um, but it's yet it's in it, it has uh, modernism um, in there somewhere. Another such artist is Denaika, the defence of Petrograd, nineteen twenty seven. You know, in the first well, Petrograd is Leningrad or St. Petersburg. You know, the city changes its name different times. In, in the First World War, the city was threatened by German troops. It's you know it's a very westerly city in Russia, so it's more prone to invasion. And you can see there's a sort of modernism of, of, of style here, the flattening out of space, the kind of stylization of it all. Pimenov and um, Danica, these are artists really not very well known in outside of Russia itself, again, because the, the works were not commonly seen. And then, as I say, all this kind of experiment ends in the 1930s when Stalin you know, takes things to a new level of state control and really imposes a certain uh, state ideology. So this, these are all experiments from the 1920s when a variety of different positions was possible, but that pluralism disappears. Just finish by showing you one, two works from the period after the end of the Soviet monolithic uh, rule, you know when things are starting to break down in the 1980s. It's, it's before uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 when things really changed. But here's Komar and Melamid. I saw Stalin once when I was a child from 1981 to two. So it's starting to refer to the vocabulary of uh, socialist realism, but play around with it. And of course, we're familiar with certain artists in uh, mainland China who also did the same thing slightly later. Artists like Wang Guangyi who play around with the kind of Cultural Revolution era uh, vocabulary. The Russians did it first and it's a little bit of a question what kind of influence there might have been, you know, from one on the other. Even the Tiananmen Square in 1989, it was, you know, partly about responding to Gorbachev who was there. Sense of China looking at changes in Russia and, and taking some inspiration from that. And this is Kozolapov, Gorby, 
He, of course, is the transitional figure, the communist leader who produced an end to the communist regime and the fragmentation of, of the, the Soviet bloc. And clearly, this is, of course, been like after Andy Warhol. So, uh, you know, instead of being art in the service of propaganda, it's art deconstructing propaganda. Uh, just as Warhol lets us know uh, Marilyn Monroe as a kind of image in a way, ra rather than you know, image and reality are, are, are not the same thing. That wasn't even really her, her real name. She was Norma Jean, not Marilyn. And uh, this is, wasn't even Marilyn Monroe. It was Marilyn Monroe as somebody in a film, you know. So uh, you know, it's all about sort of fabrication and the role of images in that. But of course, the way that, that uh, Gorbachev has been treated to make him like Marilyn is also sort of feminizing him. So there's another <laughs> sort of dimension that goes on here. And that, that also happens with the, the Chinese artists, like Li Shan, the Shanghai artist. He likes to, he liked to produce these sort of feminized Ma Mao, young Mao images. Puts lipstick on Mao. I think it's all sort of, kind of you know, it has been done before by the, by the Russians. Okay, we can take our break there. It's just slightly late, but I want to finish looking at that.